Well, here we are, another week of looking at fun and excitement in Isaiah. It's interesting <laughs> that as we're in this space in the book where Isaiah is kind of talking about what's going to come, and we're seeing these natural disasters play out in our world and in our country, it's, it's this interesting juxtaposition of what it's like to be witnessing that from fairly close hand, but yet we're not going through it, which which is a good thing. But you kind of get a little understanding of what the people of the day were going through. And so keep that in the back of your mind as, as we go through these next couple of sections. Oh, hi, kitty cat. <laughs> um. I want to pick up again with verse, we're in chapter 2. Um, I want somebody to read verse 17 through 22 for me, please. 17. I'll do it. Go for it, Catherine. 17 through... The arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day and the idols will totally disappear. Men will flee to caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. In that day, men will throw away to the rodents and bats their idols of silver and idols of gold, which they made to worship. They will flee to caverns in the rocks and to the overhanging crags <clears throat> from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. Stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils. Of what account is he? Thanks. Hi, Joanne. Hi there. Where where are we at again, please? Um, we're in chapter two. We just read seventeen through twenty-two. Thank you. And as we left off last week, God is really judging the arrogance and the pride of the people. That's their chief sin. That's what's led them away from God. That's what's led them to worship other idols. That's what's led them to reject God's precepts, but in the process, still continuing to worship like nothing's going on. It sounds weird that people would do that, right? It, it, it kind of sounds strange that somebody would be willfully disobeying, but yet showing up to worship all the time. But yet when you stop and think about it, that's not so far-fetched, is it? Mm -hmm. Now, now, sadly, people do that all the time. And it's really, again, that arrogance and pride that enables people to do that. They're able to separate themselves from what God would desire in a way that they can justify their actions by saying, God hasn't done anything yet. I'm good. <laughs> I'll keep doing this <laughs> until the day comes when God says enough is enough. And we see that here when God makes his presence known. What's the people's reaction? How can you do that to us? <laughs> They didn't they hide away too? They're hiding in the caves. Yeah. yeah. You ever do that as a kid when you know you've done something wrong and your parent was looking for you? 
you're running hide under the bed, go in the basement, hide in the closet. <laughs> you just don't want to face it because you know you've messed up. And that's really the response. The people know they've messed up and know that they've crossed a line. And the reaction is to run and hide. And then they take all of these things that they had worshipped, all of these idols that they'd created, and throw them away. These weren't cheap trinkets. They're made of silver. They're made of gold. And yet, out of fear, they're willing to part with that and just toss them away. But then I love how this section concludes. Stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils. Of what account is he? What does that say? Stop trusting in man's trust in God. It's what you're supposed to be doing. But why don't we do that? Don't like the answer sometimes. Don't like the answer, yeah. <clears throat> We're busy doing things. It's harder to see God's action. Yeah. And we think we know better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Goes right back to that arrogance and pride. Like I said last time, you know, my definition of sin is the middle letter of the word S-I-N. And it's the same with pride. P-R-I-D-E. It's the middle. It's, it's the centerpiece. We are the centerpiece of our world. And when we adapt or adopt that stance, who are we? Who are we? We're trying to be God. Does that work? Are we very good gods? <laughs> no. No. But yeah, we want to be. Uh, one of the most helpful things I learned going through the Community of Hope training um, was to um, accept or not try to fix people, meet them where they are, not where you think they should be. And that was very enlightening for me because I am I like to fix things. <laughs> I like to make it better. <laughs> But that's my opinion. <laughs> and that's hard to do. Oh. Yeah. It really boils down to the fact that the people of that day really didn't want to follow God. Things had been going good. They were prosperous. Their thought was, why do I need God? I'll, I'll go through the motions. I'll, I'll play church. But then when it all starts to hit the fan, they don't have any place to turn. And in the next section, we're going to see how this is going to play out. These first two chapters have kind of been setting the stage, as we talked last week. Um, it was an arraignment. They were hearing the charges against them. And now the sentence is going to be proclaimed. So who would like to read in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 for me? Go ahead, Vita. 
For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah stay and staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. The mighty man and the soldier, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the man of rank, the counselor and the skillful magician and the expert in charms. And I will make boys their princes and babes shall rule over them. And the people will oppress one another, every man his fellow and every man his neighbor. The youth will be insolent to the elder and the base fellow to the honorable. When a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have a mantle, you shall be our leader, and this heap of ruins shall be under your rule. In that day he will speak out, saying, I will not be a healer. In my house there is neither bread nor mantle. You shall not make me the leader of the people. Thank you. God is going to start by taking away the basic necessities of life, the things people need for survival. I think your version said stay mm -hmm. and staff. Um, mine says yeah. supply and support. He's going to start by removing the things they need to live. And then he's going to remove the leadership. But you're going to start by taking away food and water. That's harsh. <laughs> yes. Why would he do that? Well, he's angry with them. He's angry. They aren't doing what he told them, and they still, no matter what he does, they still won't do it. So he says, okay, I'm going to make it really hard. What happens when people don't have food and water? Eventually they die. <laughs> Eventually, they die. What else? They promise, maybe, to do what they have to do to get food and water. Yeah. Desperate people do desperate things. And when you're starving you might resort to trying to take somebody else's food. You might resort to taking up arms and going against your neighbor. When God is going to come in and tear apart the land, the people, the society, he is going to do it thoroughly. Hmm. He's going to start by taking away their bare necessities, the things they need to survive. Then he's going to move on to the civil and military leadership. He's going to remove all of these people that the people have been trusting in. <laughs> you know, the princes, the kings, the judges, the rulers, all of these people had, one way or another, been leading the nation astray. So God is going to remove them and leave behind a vacuum, vacuum of leadership. He's even going to go so far as to remove the clever enchanter, the counselors, the skilled craftsman, he's going to strip society bare of anybody who has any sort of skill or ability to lead, even those who do it in a bad way, the enchanters, the sorcerers. You know, we would think of today like the psychics. You know, sometimes people turn to 
those to try to figure out what's going on. God's going to wipe the slate clean. All they're going to have left is to look around at one another. People don't like not having a leader. As much as we like to say we're independent and, you know, we, we can do our own thing, they still want somebody in charge. And so they're going to go to anybody who looks like they might have any semblance of anything left. Hey, you have a coat. Be our leader. <laughs> I mean, that's how far it's fallen. <laughs> I will not add political commentary to that, but <laughs> sometimes it seems like that's what we're running into even today. He'll make boys their officials and mere children will govern them. Yeah, that's, that's not a reflection of age. It's really a reflection of experience. What happens when you have inexperienced leadership? Make mistakes. Pardon? You make mistakes. You make mistakes. There's no wisdom behind your decisions. You sometimes do things that seem right, but in the long run have consequences. And quite often you make decisions based on what's best for you and your interests, not what's best for the masses. Again, People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. When you remove the supplies needed to live and you have inexperienced leadership, the result of that is going to be chaos. You are literally going to have neighbor turning against neighbor and there's nothing to stop that or to intervene. That's how God is starting the judgment. He's going to do it from the bottom up. He could simply just bring an external army in and take them off into captivity. And he eventually will do that. But he's going to start this judgment against the people from the inside, from the bottom up. As he's destroying society from within, it makes them very vulnerable to attacks from without. Very vulnerable. In fact, so vulnerable that when the attack does come, there's no resistance. That's the idea behind this. There's nobody left to resist. How does that make you feel? Remember, Helpless. this is the loving God. Helpless. Anxious. Anxious. What was that, Joanne? Helpless. Helpless. Yeah. Can you start to see why God would do this? When you remove all visible means of support and then start bringing in the pressure. What's left? What's left to turn to except God? 
Yeah. Sometimes that plays out on an individual basis. It's that whole proverbial, someone has to hit rock bottom before they start looking up. But he's not doing this to just individuals. He's doing this to an entire nation. An entire nation made up of his people. This is where some people struggle with this idea of judgment. Why would God do that to people who he supposedly calls his own and loves? And it's a very valid question. Why do you think he would do that? I think it's like you said, so that he all you can turn to is God. You know, when you're down on your yeah. knees, you're finally in a place of being open to change. Yeah. And God tried everything else. So in a way, this is a last resort. How do you think that looks for the surrounding nations? Because remember, <laughs> at this time, people were worshiping all sorts of different ways. Um, you had people who were worshiping the idols. That's what some of the surrounding nations were doing, and that's what crept into Israel and to Judah at that time. Each nation tended to worship their own god. And so... You're a surrounding nation, and you're seeing Judah going through all of these troubles. And you're looking at it going, their God's not so powerful. Their God can't protect them. Their God is taking away all of these things. The people are struggling. So maybe their God isn't as powerful as we thought. And that will do one of two things. Number one, it will allow those neighboring countries to kind of puff up themselves and say, well, we're not going through those things. Our God must be stronger than their God. And number two, it gives them that opening to say, we're going in. We're going in because no one can stop us. Their God can't stop us. They can't stop us. So we're going to go in. And that's what's going to happen. The Babylonians are going to look at this and say, our God's stronger than theirs. Their people are weak. So we're going in and taking over. That's how God can use another nation to come in and carry off his people to exile. But there will come a time in this process that God is going to judge those other nations for what they've done. Right now, they're going to be an instrument that he is going to use, but then he's going to turn and condemn them for not worshiping him. It seems unfair. <laughs> it seems a little backwards sometimes. But at the end, what God is going to say is that I am God of everything, everyone. And I will use you 
and you and you and you to do my will. But I'm still going to hold you into account for rejecting me and worshiping these other gods. Isaiah is amazingly complex in that way. It's this interesting look at how God interacts in the affairs of man. The question today is, does God still do that? What do you think? I think yes. How I so? Think so. <laughs> I think he uses one person to help bring another person to him or uses your sins to lead you to a better life. There are a lot of people who struggle with this concept. Many of our founding fathers, some were Christian, some were deists. They believed in a God. They believed in a God who created the universe and then sat back and watched it unfold. A God that doesn't have any interaction with this creation. That's very much an enlightenment way of viewing things. It's very much a way of putting man on an equal pedestal with God. But the bigger question is, if God doesn't interact or intervene with his creation, why would he send Jesus? Because mm -hmm. that is really the ultimate intervention in the affairs of man. Keep that in the back of your, excuse me, in the back of your mind. Because ultimately, through all of Isaiah, we start to see this thread of redemption. We start to get little glimpses of the Messiah. Some are hints. Some are direct prophecies, but through all of this, what we have is a setup, if you will, for the coming of Christ into the world. Not to judge it or condemn it, but to save it. And these are just example after example after example of how God deals with sin. Sometimes there's very real physical, spiritual, emotional consequences. As we're seeing here, there's very real consequences to rejecting God. He's going to take away a whole bunch of stuff. Sometimes it's not pretty. But ultimately, the desire is to bring people back. And we're starting to see, as we go a little further into Isaiah, 
those glimpses, those glimmers of hope, if you will. Because if he didn't bring that in, people are just going to turn and walk away from all of this. If all you're hearing is the bad, the bad, the bad, the bad, you're bad, I'm judging you, I'm taking away all of this stuff, and I'm not giving you any hope, why would you continue to listen? When I was in seminary, and we were taking class on preaching, now, I come from a Lutheran background, and Lutheran theology is very clear on this whole concept of law and gospel, sin and grace. And it has to be a mixture of both. Because if people don't know they're sinning, what do they need a savior for? But if all people are looking at is the bad, they're going to turn away from that good because they've shut off their brains and they're not listening anymore. So we need to bring that balance. And, and Isaiah is really where Lutheran theology grabs onto that concept of, yes, we need to point out that you have gone astray. But if we leave it at that, there's no hope. You have gone astray, but here, here is my promise of restoration. But if we only focused on the promise of restoration, people are going to go, I don't need it. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> exactly like the people in Isaiah's day. Yes, Joanne. So uh, how, how are... How are our Episcopalian thoughts different from the Lutheran ones that you're talking about? It depends on who you're talking to within the Episcopal Church. But not who you're talking to in the Lutheran Church? They all have that same? Oh, no. No, that's that's the theology. But you've got a wide spectrum who say, oh, no, we're only going to focus on the law. We're only going to focus on the sin. And others who will say, we're only going to focus on the grace. And it needs to be a balance of both. And that's what's so powerful about it is because when you do balance both, something amazing happens. The Holy Spirit moves in and starts changing hearts. <laughs> we don't try to change heads. Because people are stubborn. We change hearts, and that's the job of the Spirit. And that's the whole message of Isaiah, is that through all of the bad, and he's going into great detail about what the bad is going to be, into that there's this spirit of hope that comes. But he's not quite there yet. <laughs> Who would like to read verse 8 through 12 for me? Hold on, I'm kind of curious about what the message says on that. Would you be willing to do that? Yeah, sure. Jerusalem's on its last legs. Judah is soon down for the count. Everything people say and do is at cross purposes with God, slap in my face. Brazen in their depravity, they flaunt their sins like degenerate Sodom. Doomed to their eternal souls, they've made their bed, now they'll sleep in it. Reassure the righteous that their good living will pay off, but doom the wicked, disaster. Everything they did will be done to them. Skinny kids terrorize my people. Silly girls bully them around. My dear people, your leaders are taking you down a blind alley. They're sending you off on a wild goose chase. I like that. <laughs> I like that because that pretty much sums up 
what's happening. The people, I love the analogy of a boxer. Been punched and staggering. It's pretty soon going to fall down for the count. He's kind of laying it out in a way that the people can't refute. There are going to be many people who are going to try to say, that's not us. But the deeper Isaiah goes into this prophecy, the more and more it cuts to the heart. But in verse 10, he gives this glimmer of hope. Tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. What does it mean to be righteous? I don't always think of that as a good descriptive word. How come? Um, it seems more, I know it all. I'm better than you. I'm at the top of the pile. I'm righteous. Everything's right. <laughs> and maybe that's the wrong inter you know, interpretation. But when I hear it, that's what I think. It's interesting because that's quite a bit where people's minds go. That's My... self-righteous. Okay. My version says, tell the godly yep. that all will be well for them. They'll enjoy a rich reward. And to me, that means a little different than the righteous. that people have, um, the ones that have followed will be rewarded, who followed godly ways. Does righteous mean, does righteous mean right with God? Does it yes. mean? Yes. Yeah. That's what mm -hmm. it means. I think it can also mean the people that have faced their sin, who've done the part of working on their sin so that they can get to salvation. You know, maybe at least for now, they're on the right side of it. It quite literally means those who are right with God. Doesn't mean that they're perfect. That would be the self-righteous. <laughs> But what it means is they, as Hulda said, you've recognized and you've turned and you're coming back to God. It doesn't mean that we jump through a bunch of hoops and perform a lot of things to get to that point. It simply means that we trust in God. We trust in God for his grace. Not what we can earn, not what we pretend, but in his grace alone. There were people in Isaiah's day who did that. There's this remnant of faithful people, not the ones who are faithful on the outside, but ones who are faithful in their heart. There's this remnant that he is going to take through all of this. Those are the people that he's saying, hang in there. Hang in there. It will be well with you. will be. 
Is that a present tense or a future tense? We're going to get a little picky here. <laughs> Is he talking about the immediate time frame, or is it going to be something that's coming down the road? In the future, down the road. In the future. Yep. Yep. Future conditional. <laughs> Remembering my, trying to remember my grammar. Yep. If you trust, it will be well with you doesn't mean that you're not going to go through a bunch of junk. It doesn't mean that you also won't be carried off into captivity. It doesn't mean that you're just going to sit back and watch all of this unfold and you'll be fine. No. You're going to be in the middle of it with everybody else. But you will have this assurance that when you get through this, it's going to be okay. Why do you think God would do it that way? Why wouldn't he just pull his righteous people aside and stick them off, oh, say, in Australia, and let them ride it out there, and then pull them back when it's over? <laughs> I think for me, having a community of of people that are trying to go to do good enables me to do good myself. If I was trying to do it all on my own, I don't, I don't think I could do it. What does it do for those around you? You mean if you are the righteous person or if you're trying to be? If you're the righteous person and you are still worshiping God with all your heart in the midst of all this calamity, how do you think others see that? I think that's part of the hope that's being promised. And um, and if you're the righteous person, I think it's your job to see yourself in the people who are struggling. Talk about a great evangelism tool. Does it give people courage to try to be righteous themselves yeah. when you know you have others around you? Yep. Yeah. You're going through the same stuff, but you have peace and your neighbor doesn't. And your neighbor's <laughs> looking at you and going, hey, I want what they have. How do I get that? How do I have that same peace in the midst of chaos that they do? Talk about an oppor opportunity. Talk about an open door. Talk about a great way for God to step in to an individual life and to change a heart. When everything has been stripped away, but yet that person still has hope. That's a pretty powerful message. You want to have fun, go back and read the book of Job. <laughs> Everything gets stripped away, but yet he still clings to that hope, doesn't understand what's going on, doesn't always like what's going on, but he still trusts in God. And that has an impact on his friends. They see that. Who would like to read verse 13 through 17 for me? Then we'll wrap it up. Tom? <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll try, but uh, the text of my Bible uh doesn't follow very well with what we're generally reading but uh so bear with me
verses 13 through 17? Yes, please. Thank you. The Lord takes his place in court. He rises to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people. It is you who have ruined my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. What you do mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. The Lord says, the women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, and with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Therefore, the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion. The Lord will make their scalps bald. Thanks. I like what you wrote. What what Bible is that? That's the well, NIV. Now I have to go look. <laughs> no, it's the NIV. It's the New International Version. Oh. New International oh. Version. Yeah. yeah. I, I had the Revised Standard. It wasn't far off of that at all. Yeah. Well, it wasn't far off. I just liked some of... Uh, some, I just liked yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like the fun. NIV. That's the version I use. Okay. Yes, I'm new to Bibles in general, so this is the version that I was uh, suggested to purchase. You picked a good one. Thank you. You picked a good one. I like how the Lord is entering into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people because they have ruined his vineyard. He, he uses the term vineyard as a metaphor for the land. He basically points fingers at them and says, you wrecked my vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor? Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Hold it. Does that resonate with you today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's your ministry. Yeah. Not much has changed. Not much has changed. And it's the leaders who are doing this. That's one of the reasons why God is going to remove them. And he's going to allow inexperienced people to come up behind to do it even worse. He's going to purge this from society, at least temporarily. Because at the end of the day, people are people and we're selfish and we're greedy and we're going to go right back to doing what we've been doing. But God is making it very clear here that this is wrong the movie wall street said greed is good god says this is wrong <laughs> and then he shifts gears he starts to talk about the women I'm outnumbered here. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got some harsh words. I love the description. Walking around with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, tripping along with mincy steps with ornaments jingling on their ankles. The visual of that is powerful. This is who the women are. They're more interested in glamour and beauty than they are in being godly women.
And he is going to judge that. I'm not going to go into much depth on that right now because I just wanted to plant that seed. When we're together next, we'll kind of go into more detail about why. Why is that bad? And what is going to happen? But suffice it to say that God is going to strip away all the external finery and leave this bare frame to rebuild. He's attacking all sorts of segments of society that lead people away from him. Now, he's not saying that having a nice hairdo and fancy clothes and makeup is wrong, despite what our fundamentalist friends would say. What he's saying is that that has become their identity. And like anything else that keeps people away from God, he's going to remove it. And it's not going to be pretty, but he is going to remove it. I'm going to stop there. Um, I will not be here next week. And Sharon and I still haven't really coordinated on what's going to happen when I'm gone. But what I want you to do is read the rest of chapter three and chapter four and five. Just do that ahead of next week, please. And then we'll come up with a game plan on how we're going to address that. Does that sound fair? Okay. Okay. Any questions on what we've done so far? Hmm. Is it the, whole... Would it just be the worst thing if the women all lost their hair? For them, yeah. Yeah. J but what would it be a, a bad thing... Um, Religiously, or just that, just for their own sake of ego? For the sake of their ego. What they're going to do is they're going to have their head shaved, they're going to lose all of their ornaments, and they are going to be slaves in Babylon. Mm -hmm. They're going to go from being the haughty, proud, beautiful people to having everything stripped away and become a slave. They're the lucky ones. Because <laughs> most of the men are going to die. <laughs> how, what years are we talking about? How, how soon before Jesus is born? We're about 700 some years away. Okay. You know, this, uh, the last paragraph with, with all the ornaments and the, um, you know, obsession with external beauty things it kind of made me think of all of these online influencers these days and who would have, <laughs> and, yeah. and who would have thought in the word influencer would become a career i don't even really know what they do but i'm not too interested <laughs> wow <laughs> it's the look at me yeah yeah look at me listen to me yeah Twenty seven hundred years later, nothing's changed. <laughs> nope. What's changed is the promise of hope and the promise of salvation that comes through the mess that we live in. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and I will see you in two weeks. Are you having a vacation? Are you doing something fun? <laughs>